Missing Secrets, a necessity for all spies. A spy is targeted and selected and recruited because he has access to the secrets. And once he becomes a spy, he steals the secrets. But for them to ever be any good, he somehow has to pass them to the controlling intelligence service that he's working for. Agent communication is the most dangerous part of any mission. And it's not only your own life, it's also the uh, well-being of your family. Even today, spies continue to operate secretly within the United States. Russian businessmen, bankers, journalists, and you would suspect some of whom are intelligence officers, but you're not sure which ones are, and you can't follow all of them all the time. Top secret documents, microfilm, secret writing, photographs. Agents must use any means necessary to convey the stolen information. You cannot have espionage in any way, shape, or form unless you can communicate. spies are recruited because of their access. That's the, the only reason they're being recruited is to what information they can provide to the service that is trying to recruit them. Uh, but most people aren't inherently good spies. Recruitment is in itself a very tough process. Lots of problems are involved in trying to locate or spot the right person. An individual who'd be willing to sell his own country's secrets for whatever reason, ideological reasons, or maybe because he was unhappy in his agency, was not ever promoted, was slighted or discriminated against because of the color of his skin or his sexual orientation or his political views or maybe even his appearance. People feel unhappy at times uh, and they may switch their uh, loyalties to the other side if the other side offers something better. If you think of the acronym MICE, M-I-C-E, M stands for money, I is for ideology, C is for compromise, and E is for ego. If you take those four basic weaknesses and combine them with failed careers and alcoholism, any of those vulnerabilities could be selected by a very smart intelligence service to find your particular weakness. Recruitment can come in many forms. It could be the person that you meet at a bar who likes your same hobbies and is interested in your work. It could be the friend you make when all of a sudden you find yourself behind in your bills and this miraculous person appears. It could be that beautiful girl that sat next to you on the plane and is just so interested in your work. Once you establish a relationship with a case officer, the next is how to keep it secret, really hidden from public view, from the view of the counterintelligence services. And we know in the United States, the counterintelligence service has been very strong. Counterintelligence believes that a good offense is the best approach to uncovering spies within their agency. A counterintelligence service will try to recruit a foreign intelligence officer if that officer may have knowledge of spies working in the host intelligence services country. And that's one of the, the strong currencies that a defector can use to, to in effect buy his position in freedom is say, I come to you with secrets, but especially I'm going to name our spies that are in your service or working in your country. The truth is, would thousands and thousands of Americans that have security clearances and have access to secrets, it's, it's virtually impossible, certainly impossible, to prevent one of them from going out and doing, doing the wrong thing. But if you have good penetrations of the other services and who can tell you about their operations against you, that puts you in the best uh, position to defend yourself and protect yourself. When the KGB recruits an American spy, they must be immediately taught how to transfer the information they steal. You have to establish such a line of uh, communications which would provide absolute security. There's nothing absolute in this world, obviously, but the maximum security in communicating. And for that reason, we used all sorts of gimmicks or uh, tricks or tradecraft. 
one of the most critical parts of an espionage case and the most dangerous part of an espionage case is passing information. Microfilm under a phony callus. The CIA's predecessor, the OSS, produced dozens of training films to drive home the message to officers that there is a right way and a wrong way to conduct oneself when passing secrets. Throughout history, counterintelligence services have known that spies have to hide secrets on their body or in their body. In almost any way you can think of doing it, it's been done before professionally, and some counterintelligence service has developed a way to find it. No smoking. Don't try that again. You're not the first who's tried to burn a message in a cigarette. Trained counterintelligence services are taught to carefully examine any form of an item, a smoking accessory that a person may carry. Now this normally appearing pipe is actually a concealment. And when opened, it's designed to have a cavity that allows a small piece of microfilm to be concealed, but allows the wearer to smoke at the same time. Now an effective way for a spy to use this would literally be to approach the checkpoint smoking because a guard is less likely to search a lit pipe. But if the spy is already under suspicion, a trained investigator would find this in the first search. But you see, the enemy knows the more important a piece of evidence is to you, the more important it is to them. Shoes make an effective hiding place. And for years, anywhere that you could look at a shoe, there's numerous places for hiding. One of the most effective, this is a KGB shoe, and the heel has been notched to be removed. There's a metal supporting rod that supports the cavity to ensure that as the wearer walks, you don't get a natural depression. But it's been hollowed out and is exactly the correct size to hold two half cassettes of Minox film. You could have up to 300 pages of documents photographed with ultra-thin base film inside this small cavity. Once it's tacked back on, it's effective to wear, and unless there is an invasive search, would be extremely difficult to detect. During World War I, German counterintelligence detected spies crossing the lines that had had messages tattooed on their heads and then allowing hair to grow back so that it was only when the head was shaved that the message could be revealed. And photographs uh, still exist of that happening. Equally so, it was found that you could use the back of human skin to write a, a message in invisible ink. You could not see it, but once you applied the, the reagent, you could literally recover the secret letter or the message written on someone's back. And if they would pick a, a female agent, it was much less likely that a male agent would be searching her private parts or looking on the skin for secret writing. Some of the very old techniques are still very effective. Just because something is old and out of use doesn't mean that it wouldn't work today. Any orifice of the body can be used to hide information. Now there's some that probably come to mind, but one of those that people normally don't think of is the human eye. And in World War I, German counterintelligence detected a Russian spy crossing the border that had his message concealed in a false eye. And this glass eye can be used very effectively to conceal a small piece of microfilm bleached and pasted inside. And it's the type of item that a counterintelligence investigator, regardless of how seasoned or trained, may not effectively see the first time. But under close examination, this too would also be detected. Our friend here seems a little perturbed about his feet. It might be wise to show as much concern for this region as he shows by so nervously biting his lip. Unless the spy truly believes it's effective, he will act in an unnatural way. He'll favor the wrong foot. He'll turn his body. He'll make some unnatural action that may be detected by an alert investigator. 
And an investigator can sense nervousness, can sense uncomfortableness, and this becomes one of the investigator's most valuable tools. When it comes to clothes and personal effects, investigators take nothing for granted. They begin on the premise that every item contains a message and carry on from there. The amount of space needed for a cavity or a concealment on a person doesn't have to be large. And anything you could carry or wear could be used. Now this is a simple Finnish coin that was actually used by an illegal spy in the United States by the name of Rhino Hehanen. It appears normal, except if you take a small needle and place it in a tiny, almost invisible hole and push, you can open what appears to be a solid coin into two halves. And perfectly inside would fit a piece of microfilm that could have literally 50 pages of paper documents photographed on this. And tradecraft devices like this were effectively used throughout the Cold War for spies that were very important to use to pass important and sensitive information. And it's so effective, it's probably still in use today. Bills are then soaked in boiling water to separate the layers and expose possible hidden information. By boiling, it's possible to separate the halves, the two sides of some currencies. By selecting a currency that was thicker and you were able to split apart, you could insert a tiny micro dot and then glue the money back together and press it together. If the microdot was placed in a portion of the bill in which there was dark printing, it would be invisible even if held to the strong light. The only way it could possibly be felt even was by touch. But if the bill was sufficiently wrinkled, it could be effectively carried and was used, especially during World War II in occupied Western Europe. It takes more than courage and confidence to operate in enemy area. It takes cover cover which you blew by your conspicuousness. You cannot have espionage in any way, shape, or form unless you can communicate. And there's two types of communication. There's communicating instructions and information from the handlers to the, uh, to the person who is committing espionage. And then the person who's committing espionage must also communicate the materials that he is stealing to his handlers. So there is a two-way communication that's involved. Perhaps the most commonly used method of passing a secret is the dead drop. The dead drop is nothing more than a pre-assigned location where the person can actually place the information and his handler will come and pick it up, a designated pickup point, once he is aware that that information is at that spot. Therefore, they never meet face to face. They never are at the same place at the same time. You have to have some uh explanation why you are in this particular place. In the old days, for instance, we would use, say, public toilets. Now it has been largely dropped because it's not a safe place. And for that reason, the Soviet intelligence practiced widely, and not only in the United States and elsewhere, some fairly remote areas in the suburbs of major cities. The important thing is when the spy leaves the information, it has to be left in a public area, somewhere that's accessible to the spy and to the handler, but it has to be secret enough that a passerby just won't stop by and pick it up. So any organic item that has no value, no apparent value to a passerby could be used. And the more common the item, the better. So if you're in a foresty or a wooded area, an effective dead drop may be what appears to be just a piece of a branch. However, it's hollow and you could put in microfilm or a secret message or a one-time pad. Very effective, but only in the right area. It may be in a wooded or grassy area that there's no visible place. However, you could be right at the base of a tree on the north side, one foot away from the base, and take this spike. It's a metal spike inside. It's designed to hold a roll of 35 millimeter film. But once it's inside, you simply step on it, and it has no visible indication other than this small metallic top. 
A dead drop ideally is only in place for a matter of minutes or hours. It's never left indefinitely. Signals are used to allow the spy to communicate with his handler when a dead drop has been completed. These signals may be a chalk mark on a utility pole, on a mailbox, on a bridge, I mean, or something which is visible without straining your eyes. You pass by in a car, you drive by, and you see a sign, and no one, even if some follows you, would never, never suspect that you were looking at the sign and reading the signal uh, put for your benefit. These signals may also be used to alert the agent that there is a problem or a change of plans. There may be a signal of danger that you should not service the dead drop because the dead drop was exposed, so you stay away from it. Well, suppose you come to a dead drop and all of a sudden, belatedly, you find out that you're under surveillance, that they saw the spot, the, the, I mean, the actual uh, physical location of that dead drop. Officers working for the KGB learn skills such as signals and agent communications during years of intelligence training in Moscow. All CIA officers marked to operate overseas must go through similar training at the top secret training facility known as the farm. Chase Brandon is a senior operations officer who often teaches new recruits how to communicate and receive secrets from spies. One of the most important things that a CIA operations officer has to do while they're living and working abroad is know the city, the region, the area they're working in like the back of their hand because the local intelligence service that will be trying to find the presence of a CIA officer and identify that officer's agent network, that hostile intelligence service is certainly going to know their own city. It's not really a hard and fast rule about finding places to meet agents and assets. It's really what's most comfortable between the officer and the agents that he does run, places that they feel comfortable and feel secure. For the most part, I think CIA officers sort of tend to generally uh, work in and around uh, urban areas, if you will, cities where there are restaurants and uh, public places really to conduct private meetings, whereas our Soviet KGB counterparts prefer rural areas. It would not be uncommon for intelligence officers to spend days picking the ideal location for a dead drop. It must be an area where the spy, if questioned, could legitimize being, yet must be secluded enough to avoid attracting attention when the drop is made. We have to spend a lot of time casing. Uh, you've heard that old term in the movies, the cop movies, uh, case the joint. Well, we're always looking to get area familiarization because we have to find places where we can meet agents and assets and pass information, pass secrets in a safe and secure area. And as we're driving along here, I see one that might be uh, suitable for our purposes. It's a little underground parking garage. So let's, uh, in fact, go in and see if that might not be a place where a prospective agent meeting with me or one of my colleagues could take place. We've got an elevator and a stairwell. That's good. That gives a couple of different ways for the agent to come down and link up with me. What we might want to do is move on down to the very bottom and see if there's a little less uh, pedestrian traffic and less vehicle presence so we have a little more privacy. Okay, we're getting down to the very bottom level of this standard parking garage. A good plan to put into effect would be to inform my agent that uh, he or she could meet me at this garage on a particular day at a particular time. They would know the description of my car. They certainly would know me since I'm the person who handles them, meets with them, and I would uh, just come down and find a particular spot to park in. I want to take a quick look around. Not any pedestrian traffic down here, that's good. Quiet. Go over and make sure this door does indeed open. It is in fact the stairwell, that's good. And we'll go try the elevator. It's 
good. This will be nice because the asset comes down, the agent comes down, he or she could look around the corner. And first thing they're going to see is my car. I might even have uh, something up in the window there that would clearly make it mine. And they would walk over and get in the car and we could conduct the meeting. Are you going to go now to check? We're going to go upstairs and see uh, what's up here. Well, uh, here we are at the top of the parking garage. Let's see what we can use here operationally. Uh, trash can, you could leave something behind or on top of. Uh, this might be an interesting area to leave a message. Uh, I could actually be calling somebody. Leave the message here. Out here is an area where the agent could come through and meet me or uh, transition over toward the elevators and I see the spot here would be an interesting place to leave a message and we could do that with uh, a pen or with a message concealed inside. That could be left right there like that. The agent comes up, knows that it's here, assuming they're tall enough, they reach up, they take this, and then they walk right on through. One or the other of us will find a logical place to stop and sit. It could be like an outdoor cafe. This one's not busy now, but that's all right. Anyway, you're simply going to sit down, take out the concealment device, open it up. There's going to be some kind of message in here. You read the information, you get the, uh, the secret, take note of it, and then you're going to destroy this because this will be uh, CIA unique uh, communications paper uh, and you can just simply destroy it and you can't be then caught with any kind of incriminating information on you. Operations involving dead drops, brush passes, and other methods of passing stolen secrets occurred routinely throughout the Cold War in major cities such as Moscow and Washington, D.C. From my own experience in the old days, I used extensively the National Press Building right in downtown area. You have to have legitimate reasons to be in a particular public place. The National Press Building was a legitimate place. I was the press officer of the Soviet Embassy. He was the press officer of his own Western Embassy. So we would meet there occasionally, and we would meet even for lunch if necessary. But in the meantime, we would exchange information in isolated, secluded places where no one would watch us. The Soviets, when they would run their KGB operations and they met with their agents here in the United States, they tended to prefer sort of rural areas. In Northern Virginia and the Maryland area surrounding the nation's capital is full of wooded areas like this with out-of-the-way roads. Some of them had little parks like this one nearby. And the KGB officer meeting with his agent would simply leave something in the ground uh, near a predetermined place like this uh, unique stump. And there might be associated normal ground litter like the remnants of a picnic here. But in a key location behind the landmark would be something like this. Very much uh, an ordinary item to be found. Looks like trash, yet inside would be the message from the KGB officer to his agent, uh, instructing the agent uh, where to next meet, what kind of new information to bring the next time, or a money payment, or whatever needed to be communicated. That would be done through this system. Uh, and this was employed extensively uh, right around the nation's capital. KGB officers working in the United States, and specifically in Washington, were limited to a 25-mile radius meaning that they had to live and work within this radius unless they made official application to the State Department for permission to travel outside the 25-mile radius. If they did so, however, they were usually under surveillance. So most of their clandestine activities had to be carried out within this 25-mile radius. The KGB also had officers working undercover as journalists and commercial positions in Washington. And these were the individuals that the KGB relied frequently to go to meetings and provide dead drops because they didn't believe they were under FBI surveillance. Well, that turned about to be a very fatal and tragic mistake. In the mid-1980s, the KGB operating in Washington became suspicious. It seemed that the FBI was locating unmarked KGB cars leaving the 25-mile limit with relative ease. 
We thought that the bridges across the Potomac River were controlled by the FBI, and if a diplomatic car with a diplomatic license would cross the bridge into Virginia, there is not much in Virginia, with the exception of the Defense Department and the CIA. I mean, all major federal institutions are on this side of the Potomac River, so uh, a diplomat crossing the river unless he goes to Tyson's Court or some other shopping area, may have some other agenda. The FBI had analyzed the routes leaving the limit surrounding Washington. There were only a few ways to leave the city. Many of them involved crossing one of the bridges over the Potomac River. Major routes, major bridges, in effect, become choke points. The traffic goes through these common points. The FBI secretly planted in the hollow space above the glove compartment in diplomatic vehicles and other vehicles that were owned and used by KGB assets. They put a tiny transponder. The small transponder lay dormant in the glove compartment of many diplomatic and KGB vehicles. Just actually above the glove compartment was inserted this tiny passive cavity resonator. And one of the things they added was this tiny battery. And the battery was necessary to give each car a discrete number. As part of the operation, the FBI broadcast a series of signals at key locations that marked the 25-mile limit around the city. When the car drove through, the field would interrogate the resonator in the glove compartment, and it would not only indicate that the car was in the loop, but it would transmit the discrete number. So the FBI was not only able to tell that a car was leaving the city or was transiting, but it could tell which specific car it was. It then knew its color, its make, and it was easy to task a surveillance unit or an airplane to catch up with a car. And this was the way that the FBI was secretly tracking the KGB vehicles. And this is the first time that that secret has ever come out publicly. During the Cold War, U.S. intelligence officers often ran into their own problems while trying to operate in Moscow. In the mid-1980s, the CIA was concerned that somehow the KGB had developed a way to track their dead drops because CIA assets in Moscow were being arrested. Well, one of the intelligence officers realized that CIA officers, if they're going to leave a dead drop, in, especially in the winter in Moscow, they would always keep the dead drop, be it a, a fake rock or a stick, they would keep things well hidden within their coat, in their body. They'd go out for a walk, they'd quickly pull it out from the warmth of their body of their car, and they would hide it and walk out of the area. The heat from the officer's body would alter the temperature of the dead drop. When they would go into a park and they would place the drop and quickly walk out of the area, they were leaving an object that was much warmer than the surrounding items. At the time, the KGB was utilizing infrared technology to spot these drops. Those left by the CIA would cause a heat flare and would easily be detected. Once this was discovered, the CIA had to figure out a way to outsmart the KGB. So what they did was order from the United States small igloo coolers and they started keeping these in the embassy vehicles. And they would always keep Coca-Cola in it or different beverages to always have on hand. But the real reason in the ice was actually the dead drops. And the idea was to have the dead drops close to freezing before they place them down. And they did this as a way to give one additional level of camouflage to the drop. The KGB also had to be creative to protect caches, materials intended to be hidden for long periods of time. They would always slaughter a small animal and leave the decomposing corpse of the animal on top of the site. The problem that the KGB found was that if they visited the site several days later, they invariably found that the corpse was gone. And they discovered that other animals were scavenging the corpse. 
what they had to do was find a way that the corpse would remain in place because a decomposing animal, people are going to stay away from the area. And they finally found that there was only one known substance that would stop the animals from scavenging the corpse. And it was the one item they happened to have available because it was frequently found in the KGB mess. And what the secret sauce was is Tabasco sauce. And because of its very powerful, aromatic, strong taste, the animals immediately left the area and the corpse was allowed to decompose over the hidden cache. Coincidentally, CIA officers also found a solution in rodents and spicy sauce for solving their dead drop problems. With a city as compact as Moscow, with as many intelligence services that are operating there, as well as the KGB training their own people, you have all of the world's intelligence services that are represented there and the host service all looking for the same types of places to leave dead drops. Well, a very clever officer in the CIA said, what would happen if we took a, a dead animal, like a cat or a dead rodent, a rat, and we'll actually put the film in that, then toss it at a certain site? No one would bother a dead rat. The CIA began to ship freeze-dried rats from the United States to Moscow. Officers would eviscerate them put the secret film or message inside and sew them back up. And what they had omitted was that there is a large population of very hungry cats that live in Moscow. And the cats were stealing and eating the dead rats. The solution? Hot sauce. They came up with the same answer that the KGB had. And they found that the liberal dose of hot sauce on the freeze-dried rat made it so pungent that no cat would touch it. And this creative method of dead drops was safe. One of the greatest successes of the Cold War for the Soviets was the recruitment of American spy John Walker. It all began in 1967. Carrying top secret documents, he literally walked into the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. and offered to spy for them. After verifying the authenticity of the materials and Walker himself, this volunteer became one of the Soviet's most valuable assets. After you establish his identity and his truthfulness, you have to tell him, you have to be very discreet if you wish to continue. Normally we arranged for a personal meeting. A personal contact is next in line because we are not prepared to handle the man with, say, dead drops. We do not know him yet, we do not know how he is, whether he is prepared or willing to operate on dead drops. So we have to have a personal meeting and that's exactly how it happened to say John Walker. He was invited to meet in a week or 10 days at a prearranged place. At the time, it was common for the Soviets to keep a safe house nearby where such a meeting could take place. Walker met there as planned and was briefed on how the operation would work. We told him that he should not bring classified papers, that he should take pictures of the classified papers and bring them in undeveloped film. That's important. We told him that we shall arrange and organize a, special, a series of dead drops. And by the, by the time the meeting did take place, we already had a dozen or so dead drops prepared. As time went on and Walker grew more comfortable with his newly found career, he recruited others to be part of his spy ring. They included his brother Arthur, his friend Jerry Whitworth, and even his own son, Michael. The other people within John Walker's spy ring were selected because they had access to classified materials. In at least one case with Jerry Whitworth, it was uh, cryptographic materials, which was the most valuable. But any classified material, of course, was valuable to the Russians or to the KGB. His brother had access to schedules for various ship loading schedules. 
he encouraged his son to join the Navy so that he could get access eventually, hopefully, to crypto materials. The success of the spy ring depended on walkers collecting all stolen materials and passing them on in a series of scheduled dead drops. Intelligence services designed dead drop instructions and signal side instructions to be very simple because the spies under stress, they want it to be easy to remember and simple to execute. But with John Walker, there was a different element. They knew that Walker was drinking heavily. They recognized the amount of stress that he was under, and they knew that he was the single most important spy they had and the number one target for their country. Into the dead drop instructions, they built in a surveillance run so that Walker had an elaborate procedure to follow. And the KGB could, if they chose, be positioned somewhere along this route to see if he was under surveillance. Walker, however, was known to drink too much, and his behavior was at times unreliable. This resulted in out-of-the-ordinary instructions regarding his dead drops. Most instructions will provide some safeguards as far as counter-surveillance goes and also so that the person can find the location with fair ease. Um, 15, 20 minutes is about the longest it would take a individual for most operations. With Walker, the, the actual procedures that he would go through could be as long as an hour, maybe even longer. Uh, and the instructions themselves were quadruple redundant. In other words, he'd be giving written instructions as how to proceed and where to drop the material. Along with the written instructions, he would be given maps. And along with the maps and written instructions, he'd be given photographs that on the back of the photographs contain more maps and more written instructions, all of it doing the same identical thing. So they were attempting to make sure, one, he didn't get lost, and that he did get there as he was supposed to, and probably number two, they were just as suspicious as he, we were of him being somewhat flaky, and in essence, uh, we're concerned that uh, there was a possibility that he could get caught. In the history of analyzing KGB operations, no one has ever found dead drop instructions that had the level of complexity as those that were destined to be used by John Walker. Each drop revolved around a series of signals placed by both Walker and the Soviet handler. Each individual had two signal sites to deal with. Walker would come place a signal saying that I'm ready to place my materials down and then he would go look at another signal site that the Russian would be in saying yes he is ready also. Then they would both place their materials down and then they would use two other signal sites to say I have laid my materials down and you can come and pick them up. We did not meet him for several years. We just operated on dead drops. Eventually Walker began to travel outside the United States to have face-to-face -face meetings with the Soviets. We thought highly of the FBI performance. This is why we preferred some neutral countries where the counterintelligence services either were not strong enough or did not care about foreign espionage because they knew the espionage was not conducted against them. Many of Walker's meetings took place in Vienna. He would be given a set of instructions to follow as to when and where he would meet his handler. This process became known as the Vienna Procedure. The Vienna Procedure was called a face-to-face -face meeting. And a face-to-face -face meeting is probably the most dangerous time because you have a known, as a rule, known Russian agent in this particular case who is going to meet with uh, your asset. Wanting to ensure that Walker wasn't followed, the instructions in the Vienna procedure were always extensive. I went to Vienna and went through the procedure step by step and photographed the entire procedure. And it took me 45 to 60 minutes each time I did it. And I knew exactly where I was going each time. John himself, when he went through the procedure, each time would go for a dry run. Even though he was instructed not to, he would because again, he needed to know where he was going so he didn't get lost. He was 
by far their most valuable asset and they wanted to make sure that he was well counter surveilled and number two is they probably realized that he was not the most stable spy in their fold and very well could attract attention easily. had broken many of the rules the Russians dictated to him to ensure his safety. Large sums of money were spent, and he started to brag about his secret life to family members. Despite all this, the spy ring continued. We became aware of the spy ring itself uh, through a telephone call by his former wife, Barbara Walker. Barbara Walker called the local office of the FBI and advised that her husband was a spy. When she was interviewed, she was fairly emphatic about some of the facts that were in there, and the agent who interviewed her took down the information and disseminated it to headquarters and to the field offices involved. Espionage is a very difficult crime to prove. The FBI was surveilling Walker and they had wiretaps on his phone. But to make a conviction stick, they didn't need just circumstantial evidence. They needed to catch him in the act. One week, May 1985, they overheard a conversation in which Walker's plans for the following weekend seemed to be unrealistic and impractical. They had a hunch that this was going to be a time that he left a dead drop. Walker left for his trip, and the FBI followed. As expected, Walker veered off course and headed toward Washington. He began to follow the instructions given for a dead drop. During the time he was going through the procedures that he was using for the dead drop, unfortunately, the surveillance team lost him. We could not figure out exactly where he was, but eventually we got very lucky and he came back to actually make the drop. The first time was just a dry run. Walker made his way to the drop site and left the package as planned. He took the documents and wrapped them up in a garbage bag, tied them on up and put them into another garbage bag uh, or grocery bag and placed what we call clean garbage on top of it. And that's just garbage he had around that he'd clean out so it wouldn't leak onto the documents. He brought that to the actual drop site and placed that on out there for the Russian to pick up. And if somebody perchance would have accidentally picked up, all they would have seen was the garbage on the top and disregarded the documents that were folded down into the bottom. The F the FBI seized the bag and brought it back to headquarters. The materials inside were laid out and the documents inspected. It was verified that they were indeed classified materials. As it turned out, the FBI had also collected evidence left by Walker at another location, a single soda can. It turned out that this can was the signal to the Russians that the drop had been made. With no signal in place, the Russians continued on without approaching the site. Walker has left the can, he waits to the prescribed time, drives to the site to find his money, and he can't find any money. His money isn't there. He then goes back to the dead drop site, and he can't find his secrets. The FBI has already been there, found them, and removed them. Walker is perplexed. He doesn't know what to do. Something has gone wrong. But the sequence was so elaborate and so confusing, he thinks there's just been a, been a mistake. So he checks into a nearby hotel. Somewhere around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, a decision was made at headquarters to go ahead and arrest Walker in his motel. Walker was arrested, and eventually his spy ring was taken apart. One by one, they were arrested, convicted, and sentenced to prison terms. The damage of the 18-year operation, however, was more than anyone could have ever imagined. John Walker, the information he provided, enabled the Russians to read Navy communications, which meant they could decipher and, and understand the messages that were being sent around to submarines uh, submerged at sea. This is really the key part of our nuclear deterrent our ability to have submarines undetected by the Russians uh, with nuclear uh, uh, missiles, and yet the Soviets, in fact, would, would have known and did know the location of those submarines because they were able to read our communications. So it was tremendously damaging, and certainly in a time of war, it could have been catastrophic. 
Although the Cold War has ended, spies continue to operate under the nose of counterintelligence and law enforcement. In recent years, a listening device was found inside the State Department, and a senior FBI agent was arrested and accused of spying for over 15 years. It is believed that much of the information he stole was passed to the Russians through dead drops left around the Washington area. Proof that even today, a country's secrets are fair game in the world of international espionage. Now you can get the program you just saw on home video. Own it today. For only $19.95 plus shipping and handling, you can become part of the adventure. Get inside the worlds you've only imagined. Explore faraway places and some close by. Uncover the past and embark on your future. Have this hour-long program delivered to your door. Call now to order because there's no 